Hi, my name is Spencer Hay. I'm the Chief Science Officer at Prism Bio, and welcome to Discussing Data Science. My guest today is Christian Jerhus. Christian is a pharma industry veteran who spent close to 20 years at Nova Nordisk, first as a medical director, then moving into R&D for insulin and diabetes, before transitioning to a focus on digital health. When he left Nova at the end of 2022, he was their Chief Digital Officer within development. So welcome, Christian, and thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks, Spencer, and thanks for having me. Now, coming from an academic background myself, I will confess I'm always a little bit tickled by industry titles, um, but chief anything is obviously very important. So perhaps by way of further introducing yourself, could you say a little bit more about chief digital officer, that role, and what what sort of how you ended up there, what you were doing? Sure. So uh, at least within the uh, the space that I was in, it might have been the the issue of uh, the one-eyed needing the blind. Um, <laughs> So I, personally, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a firm believer in, in technology and how technology can actually help people live uh, fuller lives. Uh, and that has been kind of my creed uh, since pre-med school. Um, within the chief digital officer role, uh, I've had the, the privilege of working with uh, a bunch of really smart people, uh, designing how digital strategies would work across uh, a, a, an entity of development within a, a large pharmaceutical company. And and that would be uh, both in terms of uh, defining strategies that, that kind of suit the, the the corporate strategies, but also ensure that the uh, the strategies are executed upon. So that was my 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 main role in uh, in my past. It's also fair to say that uh, I do love technology. I have a uh, you mentioned digital health before. I really believe that technology is going to help uh, people uh, to, to a much greater extent than what we see today. And, and pharma is pharma. Uh, and uh, sometimes it felt a little bit like persuading uh, everyone around me that the world is actually round. It's not flat anymore. <laughs> so yeah. so here I am, um, seeing whether I can find a place where, where uh, my beliefs and my passion is, uh, is talking to other people who believe the world is round. Following up on that, so one domain that you know I'm very interested in, but I know it's an attractive domain, I, I believe, uh, of application for digital health technologies would be in clinical trials, right? Mm -hmm. So how do you see digital health technologies influencing clinical trials? So there are many players within the uh, clinical trial domain uh, that are uh, coming together to, uh, to execute a clinical trial protocol, right? There is the essence of it, uh, the people living with whatever disease that's being studied. Then there is the clinical investigators, both the, uh, the uh, PIs, uh, principal investigators, but also the study coordinators, the lab technicians, pharmacists, whatever. Mm -hmm. Then there are either CROs and sometimes sponsors, like in my previous role, the uh, company. Uh, sponsors are also the CRO, if you will. They execute their own studies. But all of these players need to come together to execute a clinical protocol. So digital health technologies in my mind are, are focused on efficiencies across that value chain, if you will, but it's also focused upon uh, harvesting new insights. And, and the closer you get to the people living the, the disease, yeah. and, and the, the better you are at capturing quote unquote unobtrusive insights in these uh, people, the better you will be able to, uh, to actually uh, focus in on what matters to them. And I believe that, that digital health technologies have that uh, prerogative. So for me, that's actually the higher value, if you will. Uh, yes, it's great with efficiency, it's cool. But but getting the, the new insights on, on how people really uh, live, live with their diseases and how technologies and drugs and whatever can help them, that's, the, uh, that's really what matters. No, that makes a ton of sense. So, I mean, how how have you seen adoption with digital health technologies in the trial space? So, I mean, maybe, and just following up on your point about kind of from the patient's perspective, right? Do you see mm -hmm. that patients are eager to kind of use these or, or yeah, what do you see as the, sort of the drivers of this? Um, I don't think there is a, there is a digital health technology. There is, there is a myriad of health technologies out there. Some are less uh, invasive than others, mm -hmm. um, which is why I'm using the, the, the term unobtrusive, right? Got it. 
So the more user-friendly they are, the better the data and the easier the adoption is. So how have I seen it? Um, I've, seen, uh, I've seen a lot of uh, technophilics loving it. Patient, not so much. Hmm. I've seen a lot of uh, data where, where, where the patients are actually using technologies day in, day out to, to manage their disease. And if it's uh, sort of the uh, the normal way of living for these patients, it becomes less intrusive, intrusive right? So I don't think there is a magic bullet out there, but the essence is that anyone applying digital health technologies must ensure that, that it is as uh, unobtrusive as possible. So you mentioned that there isn't just one sort of digital health technology, of course, right? It's this landscape, right? There are many different devices. One dimension of which you've spoken to just now, right? About kind of the obtrusiveness, right? Mm -hmm. um, but thinking about this landscape, so this is actually how we initially got connected. So PRISM is doing a project with Janssen trying to analyze this landscape. So the goal of our work with, with the Janssen innovation team was to produce a repeatable and scientifically rigorous method to quantify the use of digital health technologies, specifically with an eye towards measuring waste. So now we have a manuscript that's about to go out for peer review. We've released this public ontology of digital health technologies. There's a public analysis that replicates a 2020 study that's live on our app. And we actually developed a data science product that any sponsor could use to analyze the digital health technologies in their portfolio. And I think you've seen all of those things. Um, so I'd just be curious to get your perspective on some of these early results, like, you know, do, sort of what about this strikes you as potentially valuable or are there sort of things that you think, oh, you know, this might be a good start, but here's how, how you take it forward. I see, I see it as uh, very valuable, but there's a lot of valuable stuff in the world. <laughs> yeah. And, and most pharma companies or medical product developers, they have either time to market as the most valuable. It has more uh, patient friendly um, measures uh, uh, how many patients can you actually impact with whatever product you're developing. Yeah. You have which markets, right? The world is a very heterogeneous place. So which markets are we looking at? So all of these different cuts, if you will, of what have to uh, to be in play to, to, uh, to utilize these technologies are super important. Where where does uh, the, the complexity of ADT, uh, digital health technology, where does that lie in that uh, arena of, uh, of uh, or hierarchy of importance? Yeah. I think that differs a lot. One of the, I mean, I, and I, uh, disclaimer, nothing to do with Apple, apart from I actually love their user centricity. Very few GT uh, digital health technologies are as easy to work with as this one, mm. right? If I were to open this now, my earplugs would automatically look, uh, plug in. Right. None of the technologies that I've been able to, uh, to work with have that luxury. So they're very complicated. That means that it's complicated for the patients. It's complicated for the sites, study coordinators. It's complicated all around. So where in this hierarchy would it apply? And that's also why some of the technologies today are not as user-friendly as you would want. Yeah. Because in the hierarchy, you can't allow it to be. Does that make sense? I think so. I mean, maybe that's actually, I wanted to ask you to say more about that. Like, what is it you think that's the barrier to kind of, is it like my initial thought was, is it kind of the need for a certain level of like scientific rigor or something like that with the, you know, the technology that prevents it from being so user-friendly or is it it's something different? Yeah. Tell me. No, 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 no. no. The, I, I, I usually have a verification validation as if that's kind of the core, right? Yeah. Uh, you can't just assume that whatever technology you have works in another disease area, right? So uh, it's upon the sponsors, whoever chooses the devices to make sure that it's actually verified and validated for the intended purpose, period, right? But above and beyond that, there's a usability elements. And those usability elements are uh, vastly different depending on where you want to execute your clinical trial protocol. Mm -hmm. So part of, uh, of the work you've done with Janssen would obviously indicate that bring your own device technologies is a lot better for various reasons, right? Patients are familiar with their device. Yeah. You don't have to walk around with yet another device. There's the whole, you know, do I leave it at home or do I carry it with me element? All of these kind of things, right? Which is usability elements. 
that require that the space that you're executing a trial in allows for BYOD. And, and in very many instances it does, and in others it does not. Mm -hmm. So when we're moving into digital health technologies using wearables or other sensors to capture data, that connectivity between the, the, that technology and the data conduit, the smartphone, the uh, watch, whatever, is essential. And, and you cannot do BYOD because then you will have uh, you know, a myriad of different technologies that have to right. fit with this one. And then you lose the link, which is back to my, my point in terms of, uh, of making sure that this is actually doable. You also need to execute your trial within a certain period of time. Yeah. Right? And, and having uh, people uh, uh, withdraw from a trial because of complexity is not fun. You know? Believe me. I've been there, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, 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 so we have to have all of these kind of ecosystem mentalities uh, in mind. Let's transition there to this issue about the, as you put it, the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of digital health technologies that you think are sufficiently robust to add value in clinical development and in mm -hmm. real world patient care. But it sounds like you have questions or sort of, or you're not seeing the, the level of adoption that you think maybe could be there. Is that, is that fair to say? Yeah, it is. But it's also, uh, uh, the, these devices are, of course, with, robust for a particular purpose, right? It's a little bit back to my uh, point about the intended use of a device. Yeah. Huge difference, whether you're doing it for fun, you're tracking your exercise by, by your Fitbit, whatever. Yeah. Or you are using it as a, a part of a data acquisition model for a clinical trial that has uh, to undergo regulatory review. Major difference, right? Yeah. Major difference between whether you're doing it for the PC study, whether uh, or, or whether it's a it's a Parkinson study. People move differently. You need to make sure that it makes sense. Yeah. So all these kind of things are 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 important in in this context. So. I mean, that's interesting and it resonates with some of the work I did previously back in my academic life was focused a lot on like diagnostic testing for biomarkers in cancer. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting to see that, I mean, it's a different domain, right? Of course, and different kinds of technology, but there were similar issues where it's like, well, this biomarker test is great for this cancer and this mm -hmm. diagnosis, mm -hmm. maybe not so good for this one. Exactly. And there's this challenge then of like, okay, well, who is going to generate the data? Who's going to do the work to figure out where it works, when, whose responsibility is it? And one of the things that, I mean, I found it a little bit dispiriting, but maybe it's just the way that it is. It's like, there are really so many questions, right? So many possible uses for these things that you think, well, we're never going to learn it all, right? So we have to make decisions at some point about like, okay, well, we want to use it in this case, let's do a dive there, right? Mm -hmm. And validate it. But yeah. I know it's, I think what's interesting is that it seems like, you know, pharma companies have an interest in this insofar as they want to use digital technologies in their trials, but like, they're not the makers of the devices, right? And do the device makers want to do that to help, farm, right? So I don't know, there's this interesting, it seems like, as you said, like, the incentives don't all pull in the right direction in the ecosystem, right? They may, they may, right? So if that's back to the, uh, the, the it calls for partnerships. Yeah. Pharma companies are great at, at uh, drug development. And, and commercialization of drug development, device developers are great at that, or yeah. allegedly so, right? right? So partnerships are needed in order to go into that space, or uh, and that could be uh, academic partnerships, it could be uh, corporate partnerships. And you know from uh, from your work with uh, with Janssen, for instance, that they're uh, they're very good at, at at generating these partnerships, but yeah. also engaging in, in, in on the European side of things. Uh, uh, activities to uh, to make sure that these endpoints are actually uh, developed and validated so that you have things to pull out of the library if you will yeah but essentially uh, if you want to deploy it, a a digital endpoint or a captured endpoint in your clinical trials you own it and then you need to make sure that you can uh, assure that it's both verified and validated for that particular purpose yeah that's helpful another piece of the puzzle I'm curious to ask you about would be when physicians need to get involved, right? 
maybe in, in the context of a trial or maybe, you know, post trial, right? It's like, okay, like, what have you sort of seen as far as like physician comfort with kind of adopting digital health technologies to measure or track, yeah, measure or track certain things? Yeah, well, I, you know, I'm a physician, right? Um, yeah. I think physicians are as different as anyone else. That being said, most people or everyone uh, actually engaged in clinical trials, uh, they're on the more curious side of the spectrum, if you will, yeah. and equally so towards technologies. Um, so yes, there is a Gaussian distribution of of, uh, of, of of love for technologies, but it's probably skewed towards uh, favoring uh, application of it. Our experience, my experience uh, in, in this space is that they really enjoy being able to uh, to have that investigator oversight mm -hmm. by different means. So rather than just uh, being blindfolded for a period of time between the visits, they actually have opportunities to follow their patients and, uh, and, and they, uh, they really uh, enjoy that. So why don't we transition then now to one of the other themes you actually already mentioned, but is thinking about decentralized clinical trials. So mm -hmm. this is, you know, perhaps obviously one of the things that digital health technologies in trials can facilitate. Yeah. But I'd be curious to maybe just start with a definition, like how do you, how would you define decentralized trial? And then <laughs> sort of how do you see that, you know, what is the shift toward that or, or you know, happening in the industry that you see? I think in general, in, in, in the industry, there's been a, you know, I don't know whether that uh, terminology translates well into English, but the uh, every child has uh, a lot of uh, names, right? Um, remote decentralized clinical trials, and now it's DCTs. People who are very much into decentralized clinical trials don't believe that it's any, you know, thing unusual these days. So, uh, so now we should just revert back to clinical trials because this is how we do it. Right. So it's all the way to the place, right? Yeah. Um, in order to avoid that kind of thing, I I really uh, I really in, enjoy uh, clinical trial transformation initiatives CTTI City. Yeah. Uh, so I always uh, I use their definition uh, whenever I'm uh, discussing DCTs. Yeah. So I mean, what excites you the most then about sort of seeing a future where there mm -hmm. are more decentralized trials, or you know, if it's as you say, kind of. Well, it's really just trials, but kind of done in a different way. It, it, today, clearly, it is something out of the ordinary, right? There is a, There are a few fully virtual, fully DCTs conducted, and a lot of hybrid uh, studies. So what excites me the most is that this enables actually the what, what we're striving at, uh, whether we are regulators or whether we are pharma or medical product developers in general, we all carry the same objective. Right? There, there are people out there suffering from diseases that we want to help. So what really excites me about uh, DCTs is that uh, with brick and mortar studies, you are confined to a very, very uh, particular group of people who can actually allow you spending time in a clinical trial. It's, it's hard work being a clinical trial patient. <clears throat> with DCTs, you can, uh, you can bring pe uh, much of this to patients' homes. You can, you know, untether, if you will, uh, from uh, brick and mortar uh, in, uh, sites, and and also making it more uh, democratizing access to clinical trials to greater extent. So those are some of the the best benefits of doing it, and that allows us to moving from from quote unquote merely efficacy into something that I believe is close to effectiveness. Nice. Because you you have a more general uh, part of the population taking part in clinical trials, you have democratized it. Yeah. You get outcomes within that clinical trial that mirrors real world data. So this efficacy effectiveness discussion becomes mute. So those are things that really excite me because then then we will be able to uh, to both uh, effectively, fast, uh, 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 fast and furious, if you will, to develop things but ensure that you actually get data that you can use not only to, to get regulatory approval because it fits uh, efficacy data, but also have a reimbursement because it's close to effectiveness data. Yeah, no, I love that. I mean, all of the, I mean, that just sounds like that's a win-win, right? I mean, and probably more win-win-win, it's like there's so many parties that can benefit there, yes. right? It seems like regulators, developers, patients, right? Device makers. Um, 
Yeah, that is it, really exciting. At some point in time, yes, right. And, and just because we uh, are, I'm, uh, I'm I'm based in Denmark, right? So uh, just prior to Christmas, we received a wonderful gift from the European Medicine Agency on on uh, recommendations on on uh, DCTs uh, in Europe. FDA has been uh, ahead of uh, of the game for quite some time. So now. Uh, the uh, the the regulators are becoming more and more acquainted, obviously due to the pandemic, with with the use of DCTs and elements of that DCT, uh, and describing how and where, where it can be used, uh, allowing for broader use, because otherwise, it has been honestly the the lowest common denominator game, mm. right? Uh, yes, a lot of things could happen uh, uh, under uh, FDA purview. Very few things could happen under EMA purview, uh, PMDA purview, whatever, right? Um, mm-hmm. And you would always, since it's the same protocol that sponsors right. are executing worldwide, right. you will go for the lowest company on minute. This also goes into that uh, that now there is a there is a sh- shaping regulatory environment for how to deploy DCT elements, mm-hmm. and also looking into uh, what's probably going to be finalized in uh, twenty three. Uh, is the ICH uh, E6 R3, which also will enable that that these considerations by FDA, by EMA, and others will merge into ICH E6, and and that's where I really believe that the the the, the common regulatory framework will unfold. So, I wanted to connect this up to the decentralized trials, connected up to issues about sustainability. Mm-hmm. Do you see sort of this a movement in this direction towards decentralized trials, towards digital technologies, helping to make sort of reduce the cost or, or reduce the sort of footprint of, of research? Mm-hmm. Yes, definitely. Uh, but I think in, it's you know that you were that's that's moving into environmental sustainability. But I think there's sustainability in all different aspects of this, right? There's uh, affordability issues. There is the generalizability that we discussed before, right? There is diversity. How do we make sure that that the that the ones really intended to use the product uh, have also been started in the, in the development room? And then there is the environmental component to it. So all of these kind of things, in my mind, are are, are kind of the next frontier, right? I also think that it's this is not going to be an option. Uh, focusing on environmental sustainability is something that not only is going to be required; it's also going to be required by those people that are employed by the companies. Yeah. Because you don't want you want to work for a sustainable company, right? Looping back to how this is being um, uh, seen, at least in in, in parts of industry, um, I'm quite impressed by by what's being happening in in the sustainable marketing initiative, uh, uh, originally UK activity, but broadening out into uh, other uh, large pharmaceutical companies. My previous company was. Uh, was also part of sustainable market initiative where this is actually seen the, the uh, dcts are seen as one of the the tactics to make sure that environmental sustainability is is, uh, is observed within clinical trial conduct wow. uh, and that's that's quite exciting all right christian let's transition now i think i as i wrote you in the email hmm? we want to ask Everybody that we talk with on discussing data science, three questions, um, the same three questions. And we're just curious to see um, how the the answers may vary and what are the overlap in, in sort of thoughts and things like that. So the first one we want to start with is what do you see as the biggest data gaps right now in the field? So kind of blind spots maybe where, you know, this would be so valuable to know, but we can't yet kind of put our hands on the information. Have any of your previous guests been able to ask answer that succinctly? You know, you are guest number one, so. Uh, okay. Well, <laughs> um, data gaps. I see nothing but data gaps. Yeah. Right. Uh, I think that. Uh, let me let me try to answer it in 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 uh, in my space of uh, diabetes, which yeah, that's is great. kind of my my home turf, right? Many years ago, people measured the glucose by peeing a cup. Then technologies were uh, developed to make sure that you can poke your finger. Then technologies were uh, developed so you can actually look at your glucose levels uh, minute by minute. All of these elements created fewer and fewer data gaps. And that's just within glucose. 
Right. And there's so much more uh, that goes on in a, in a patient's uh, or a person living with diabetes, right? So data gaps is all over the place. For me, it's a matter of the unobtrusiveness uh, we discussed before. Yeah. Uh, and and also the, uh, how do we actually, how do we get a an environment where we can share these data uh, in a in a data privacy mindful manner uh, to the intended use of the data and blah 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 blah. Okay. So, uh, I think we are very much living in a data void, uh, uh, and and you can see it by the petabytes that uh, the companies are actually uh, acquiring these days, right? Moving into omics, etc. It's it's a totally different ballgame. <laughs> All right, question number two. Yeah. What excites you most about the future of research? So any sort of developments, and I know you touched on these already, but are there other developments that you sort of see like, oh, this is coming and this is gonna be transformative? Yeah. I mean, I, 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 I'm, a, I'm, I'm an outcomes guy, right? Uh, research as such is just an output, right? Yeah. You conduct a study, you get some insights, you, you may wanna file it and you get an, an output in terms of a, an approval no patient or person with whatever disease was helped by that. So um, I'll answer it the way I, I really don't care what color a cat has just as long as it catches the mouse. Hmm. So for me, uh, it's it's a matter of, uh, of getting to, uh, to helping people. Uh, and I think these technologies are going to uh, really catapult that into a different space. <laughs> All right, question number three. Mm -hmm. If you could wave the magic wand, what would you change about the industry? Ah, uh, linearity. I think most organizations are linear in its mindset, right? There is a core capability and you kind of, uh, quote unquote, you milk that core capability because it's a linear uh, uh, mentality. Uh, you don't look to the side. So my magic wand would be uh, that uh, that the, the linear the the, uh, the exponentialism, if you will, of of helping of healthcare uh, is is easier done. Um, perhaps quoting Bill Gates, right? Uh, we all believe things are happening within the next two years, um, but we kind of forget the fact that uh, it's a little slower. But it will happen within ten years, and hence we become lull. So the, the 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 more exponential people are in the two year space, the uh, the the more linear are in the, are in the ten uh, year space. So my magic wand will enable that 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 uh, link is is better uh, obtained. Interesting. Can I think I follow that? But I'm curious. Can you give like an like what will be an example? You say like here's the linear way of kind of thinking about it. But if we kind of take okay. this other so a linear way would be if uh, and linking it a little bit back to the just my, my comment about the data void. Yeah. The linear way would be that all things being equal, this particular product will be beneficial, but you're not looking to the side. It's disruption discussion. Uh, a and 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 my magic wand would be that that uh, organization would be better at uh, looking to the side, especially in the point of time where change is happening at a pace we haven't seen before. And where technology is moving uh, the needle on healthcare at a bigger pace than they were. Got it. I see. So it's like, so imagine like a development program, right? It's like, okay, we have our product where, you know, the goal is take it through clinical development, get it approved. And you're kind of heads down. We're not necessarily looking around. What are the people doing? Does this still make sense? What's happening? Can we... Is there a way that we can pivot what we're doing to it's, be more impactful? In my mind, that's 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 a little bit back to uh, the, the difference between uh, running a project with the start and the finish, and making sure that you actually are developing a product that helps people. Yeah, I see. Right. So the linear mentality would be: if you had a a, a product that was uh, beneficial, you can modify it in a linear manner. It would be better, but would it really be better in terms of the uh, effectiveness that we discussed before? Yeah, yeah, I see. Maybe. Christian, thank you so much for joining me today for this really interesting conversation. And thank you for being the uh, guest number one on Discussing Data Science. It was a privilege, Spencer. And thanks for having me on your show.
And to our audience, if you enjoyed this conversation, please uh, remember to like and subscribe and you will never miss a future episode. Um, but until next time. Thank you.